Okay, let me just make sure I. Okay. Hi, Marcy. Hello, Roger. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I hope you're able to hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. I can't see my. Hello, Prof. Yeah. Prof. Rasmus. Oh, there. I, I can also see you clearly. Yes. So thank you so much for joining us. So um, I think it's just the flow of the workshop will be as we had talked. Uh, Prof. Roger will start. Then um, we'll take a few questions from him because he'll need to move on to another meeting. And then from there, we'll have Prof. Uh, Prof. Erasmus go next. And then we'll take a few questions from him. And then from there, we go into breakout sessions where we are going to discuss um, the questions that we had outlined in the concept note. And then from there, we'll come back in plenary and the various groups will give us um, their feedback. Hello, Prof. Anna. Hi, Messi. How are you? Good afternoon, fine, thank you. And how are you? I'm fine, nice thank you. Good day, everyone. Hi, good day. Hi, so, I did. Um, one of the board members of executive board members of Afro PHC, and he'll be the chair for the workshop today. So, Prof. Anna, do you have the concept note with the bios for the speakers? No, I didn't have that. Um, I've sent you again a copy, I sent via email. And I've also sent another copy via WhatsApp right now. If you could check. I'll check. Hello, everyone. I'm just checking if I'm rightfully like in this meeting. I, I am Elizabeth and Gavan in Colongo. I'm just checking if it's actually the board meeting or is it the meeting that is open to everyone? It's the meeting that's Thank open you. for everyone. It's the monthly workshops. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So we're just going to wait for a few more people to join and maybe we'll start at five past. Anyone has any questions, concerns? I just wanted, uh, it's Prof. Erasmus here. I just wanted to check if you can hear me uh, clearly. Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly and we can also see you. So I will oh, give you co-host right so that you'll be able to share your presentation from your side. Okay. Yes. So, Mercy, um, uh, in a moment we share my share my screen or to, uh, to start a presentation later on? Um, yes. I do it um, myself, right? Yes, you can do it yourself. I've okay. made you the co-host so you can be able to do it from your side. Okay. Prof. Anna, have you been able to see the concept note with the bios for the speakers? I've just seen one. Um, so if you scroll down on the concept note, the yeah. last thing has the bios for the speakers. I've seen the one for Rajiv Erasmus. And Mercy, uh, uh, I think I have to cancel at two or a bit later than two o'clock because I have another uh, digital meeting uh, in New York. So, yes, I remember you mentioned that. So that's why we have you as the first speaker. Thanks. And then after you speak, because it usually takes for about 30 minutes, so maybe from 1 to around 1.30, then we take questions from you. And then, um, so that if you need to leave, you can 
you can just leave. Is that okay? Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you. It's also great to meet you, Professor Erasmus. Uh, I think in, in, on a later moment we can have yes. some uh, discussion. It would be great. Same, same here as uh, as well. Um, and 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 thank you very much for for that introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm based in Cape Town in South Africa, with uh, Stellenbosch University. Um, so. Um, uh, I, I think I have some some links with uh, with people in Holland. Um, right. I, I think you are you're based in Holland, isn't it? Right, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, I have some some contacts uh, with, with the with the National Reference Lab in in Holland, right. and they have been involved in uh, standardizing the A one C test. Um, yes. As you know, that has become so important in the last decade. Right. Um, yeah. I think that's the colleague uh, Robert Slingerland and his team uh, in Zwolle, yeah. the Netherlands, right? Yes, yes. And and you are based where in uh, in Amsterdam or um... in the uh, well? And uh, I have a, I, my GP work, uh, my general practitioner work in Eindhoven area, and I work also for a laboratory, and that's uh, based in Rotterdam. Oh, in Rotterdam. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, I was I was supposed to be in Utrecht um, three weeks ago, mm. but uh, I, I I couldn't make it. But it was not for an academic meeting. It was really to attend an exhibition um, in Utrecht uh, where they were exhibiting some veterinary products. All right. And my cousin, who is based in Singapore, so he established a company that is selling uh, veterinary products. So they they went to Utrecht to to exhibit, you know, uh, their, their product. Right. So that was, yeah, I think that was about, yeah, about, about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. about three weeks ago. So, have you been to, to South Africa? Yeah, I've been to Cape Town uh, once, oh, before, you, just, you, just for holidays. Have. And okay, uh, okay, so. it would be great to see uh, what South Africa is doing uh, if it comes to point of care testing in primary care. Um, yes. I'm um, curious about the, that. The, the problem with South Africa is that we don't have policies. We don't have any monitoring. We, and, 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 and that's a big challenge. So I think a lot of point of care uh, testing that is going on, we, we're not sure how uh, reliable the testing right. is but in the private sector yes it's going very well okay. because they have well tailored programs but in the government hospitals i can tell you um we did a survey and we the the results are shocking you know <laughs> half of the people uh, half of the, the the operators don't even keep records and and the reason is that we don't have a, a, a very good monitoring system um, but but slowly it's getting there, you know. Yeah. Slowly it's getting there. It's very so I think in the next uh, three four years, as point of care testing expands, you know, um, and I'm talking about major centers. I'm not even talking about primary healthcare centers. And now you can imagine if the if the big hospitals don't have a good monitoring system and a good quality management system, what's going to happen at the primary healthcare level? Yeah. And that's that's a big worry. That's a right. big worry. Yeah. Yeah. We talk so, about patient safety here, eh? and, and yes, uh, and and the whole issue uh, deals with with management. So there is in South Africa there is some controversy: who should manage the service? Should it be the lab? Should it be the hospital management? Um, so you know they've sort of got dogged down by those uh, bickering and arguments, you know. Right. And I think it's it's really more of cooperating and collaborating, you know, um, between the between the different uh, groups of stakeholders. Right. Um, uh, in, in fact, I'm yet to see a coordinating committee in any hospital on point of care testing. Right. Um, so that that's really terrible. You know, yeah. I, I remember I was in Belgium. When was it? This was about eight years ago in, in Ghent, mm -hmm. University of Ghent and the, the teaching hospital there. And they had a very good monitoring system, you know, for point of care. And that had been developed not just eight years ago, but in fact, more than 15 years ago. 
And here we are in Africa, we don't have any, any sort of uh, monitoring, yet point of care testing is being done in many, many places. But certain programs are, are going very well. Right. Some of the HIV programs, the national programs that are very focused, they're doing well. They are, they are separate from the main, you know, mainstream. Right. So they're, they're doing very well um, for CD4, um, um, viral loads, malaria, you know, they, they, they're doing well. Yeah. Right. But they are separate. They're completely separate. They run completely um, separately from the main system. Right. right. So, um, and, and, and also, um, I think for certain um, uh, in certain rural areas, especially in Kenya, in Uganda, South Africa, you know, and even in Zambia and Zimbabwe, they're doing pretty well. Hmm. Doing pretty well. Uh, yeah, well, it's uh, a big challenge uh, to to maintain quality. Uh, yeah. after and, and I'm just I'm just wondering if you know Swear Sandberg in in. Uh, yeah, I met him. You you know him, huh? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. He, He's a very close friend of mine. All right. And I have actually visited him in Bergen. Yeah. In Norway. Me too. And yes. And he has come many times to South Africa for our point of care conferences, which I organize uh, once every two years. All right. Um, yeah. For the whole of Africa, I do that. Uh, we've done two in Cape Town and one in uh, Nairobi in Kenya. Okay. Yeah, oh. and uh, we're supposed to do one this year, and if we do so, I will certainly keep you in mind. <laughs> that would <laughs> be perhaps great. You can, perhaps you can renew your links with with Cape Town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wait after my talk if you're still interested to invite me, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, what yeah. is happening? Are we 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 behind by ten, almost ten minutes? What's happening, Mercy? Yeah, I'm just checking the networks to see why people are not joining to make sure they got the link. So just let's give it up to 15 first because we had sent out an email with the link. So I'm just checking to see if everybody got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry okay. for the delay. Yeah. Yeah, but how many how many people have joined in so far? So far only two two people have joined in. That's why I'm thinking maybe there was a problem with the link. So I'm yeah, just checking I, that. Yeah. I can only see six on yeah, my so on my screen that. here. Because normally we usually have by now at least 25 people. Mm. And by the time we're getting to the middle of the workshop, we usually have about 50. So that's why I'm checking. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Took me a while to get in myself. Uh, so maybe there is some issue. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, the same. I had a similar problem because it says you must update your Zoom. You know, so. Ooh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's what appeared on my screen. So you just need to cancel that because updating at this time, uh, at this point in time, uh, might take some time. So I, I just uh, canceled it and just went straight, you know, and, and, and it just opened. But if you're going to update your, your software for Zoom, I think that's going to, that's going to cause some hiccups. Yeah. But that, that, that's usually a thing on Zoom side, not just for this account. Because sometimes mm -hmm. when they put out updates and if you don't have an automatic update, every time yeah. you try to use it, it might ask you to update first before you use it. If you haven't used it either in a while or it doesn't have the automatic update. Yeah. So um, uh, we, we held a big uh, meeting in Rome um, that was in September uh, on point of care, and uh, there is and this is this is from the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry. Uh, I'm not sure if you are aware of them. That's the biggest uh, federation of of lab scientists um, that has 95 societies uh, from all over the world. Right. And then uh, we are having a meeting in Seoul this weekend. But unfortunately, I can't go because I didn't get the visa. Um, because I'm, whilst I'm in South Africa, I, I haven't taken up the citizenship. I'm still uh, holding my Indian passport. All right. So, so for Indian passport, it's very, very strange. 
the Korean embassy says that we must have police clearance. And I've applied for police uh, clearance six weeks ago and yet to receive it. Yeah, so today was the last day because it takes three days for the visa to be issued. And for me to get to Seoul, it takes 18 hours. So um, I sh I sh if I have to be in Seoul, then I must travel on Friday. Right. And yeah, I can't do that now because it's, it's wow. Tuesday. I don't, I don't think I can get the visa, even if I got the police clearance today. Right, right. Which I haven't. So it's a big, big shame. Um, but anyway, we, we are um, again meeting on a point of care uh, um, international meeting. I think that's in next year. Right. That will bring all the point of care people from, from across the globe in, in, in Italy. In Naples, um, yeah. So from Rome, yeah, from I know the organization. I'm a little bit outside this because I'm not a clinical pathologist, but a yeah. family physician by nature. But um, of course, uh, I have a lot of contact with uh, microbiologists and pathologists. And I was actually at uh, the ACMIT meeting, um, the last European ACMIT meeting in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, also, to share thoughts about point of care testing and uh, which well, point, point of care testing is just growing by leaps and bounds, you know, and and with the advances in technology, uh, especially especially connectivity, it's made things. Okay, so I think people are kind of joining in. We can start preparing to start. I think maybe there was a problem with the link, or they didn't get the link through email. So I've just sent to our network that I think people are still joining in. So we can start because it will be recorded and um, those who miss the, the first part can get the, the rest later. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome again to our monthly Afro-PHC uh, policy workshop. My name is Masi Wanjala. I'm a family physician from Kenya. And I am the deputy executive uh, coordinator for Afro-PHC. And I'm also the lead for policy workshops. And this afternoon, we are going to be um, looking at uh, lab services and point of care testing in African uh, uh, primary health care. And we are going to look also at examples from around the world. And right now, I'd like to introduce us to our chair for the workshop today, who is Professor Joseph Anna, um, an executive board member of the Afro PHC. And um, Prof. Joseph Anna will introduce himself and also introduce our panelists for the day. Uh, Prof. Professor Joseph Anna, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good day, everyone, um, wherever you are in the globe. Um, I send bring you greetings from the Center for Clinical Governance, Research and Patient Safety uh, based in Calabar, Nigeria. As Mercy has said, um, I'm a member of the uh, um, executive board of Afro PHC, and I'm glad to be here. My background is in medicine. Um, I'm a general practitioner with interest in general surgery and urology. We also have a keen interest in promoting clinical governance um, as a tool for solving most of the challenges that we have in health, the healthcare system across Africa from primary to secondary to tertiary. And we've been pursuing this agenda actively since 20, 2004. So I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be the chair for this occasion. Thank you very much. Over to you, okay. Mason. All right, thank you, Prof. Uh, Joseph Ann, and thank you for opening for, uh, for us the workshop. So just a little bit about Afro-PHC, for those who don't know, Afro-PHC, with Africa Forum for Primary Healthcare, where our main vision and mission is to build a primary healthcare team that is specific to the African context and will drive and um, support primary healthcare development and also universal health coverage in Africa. I will put in the chat uh, our website so that you can learn more about it. Um, so for now, we are going to go uh, to our first speaker. So we'll have two speakers today after which um, we will break out into uh, our, our signature breakout discussions where we are gonna have discussions around um, uh, lab services and point of care testing. After that, we'll go into plenary 
where all the groups will present what we have discussed in their groups, and then um, we will conclude from there. So, um, just in my notes, we are going to move to our first speaker of the day. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Roger Hobsteken, who is a general practitioner in primary health care center Hapat in Hugalun and innovation specialist at Salch Diagnostic Center in the, in the Netherlands. His special interest is in point of care testing and he is involved in diagnostic research and also implementation initiatives in collaboration with uh, various universities in point of care testing. He has contributed to research publications and book chapters, particularly in the field of diagnostic testing, lower respiratory tract infection, sepsis, and uh, co um, C reactive protein uh, point of care testing. And he is also the principal author of the Dutch Multidisciplinary Guide on Point of Care Testing and Primary Care. And he is chairing the special interest group for point of care testing of the World Organization of Family Doctors, that is Wonka. And he does some consultancy work. Uh, lecturing for Abbott, Roche, Lumidra, uh, Lumirax, and uh, Photon Delta, Fisher Diagnostic, Gnostic, and Shunk MedTech. From that, you can see he has, he's very experienced in the point of care testing, and he will be uh, presenting to us today. Uh, Dr. Roger, please feel free to share your, your screen and share your presentation. And the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Mercy, for this introduction. Thank you all for listening. I'm very happy to be invited to share my thoughts and hopefully to inspire you a little bit if it comes to your particular challenges uh, in the field of point of care testing and the collaboration with laboratories in this respect. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a family physician. That means I take care of those kind of people you see here on my opening slide. Um, and uh, next to that, uh, I work at a laboratory. We call it a primary care diagnostic center because it's invented and raised by GPs, family physician GPs uh, and for GPs. That means we deliver all kinds of diagnostic services to, to GPs, including point of care testing. Um, I'm quite busy and that means that I often see those kind of waiting rooms, um, mostly because I'm not, not, not mostly because I'm too late, but because I'm very busy, you know, and you know how it, how it feels. We have too many jobs, too many patients to see and, and not so much time. So this leads to, let's say, less favorable um, uh, diagnostic procedures or even outcome for patients. Uh, we, we are more easily grabbing a recipe to, to prescribe an antibiotic, for example, or we may be uh, starting to do all kinds of laboratory tests, despite the fact that, like in this patient, it may not be very useful to do so. But this is part of the game. And sometimes I think um, doctors also suffer from, from diagnostic uncertainty. Uh, sometimes we know that, sometimes we are not aware of it. And I think point of care testing could be a real important tool for the future um, to help uh, diagnose better, to help GPs with their diagnostic uncertainty, particularly in times where there's much stress, like time constraints, but also if it comes to uh, legal pressure to do right, to do the right thing for, for a patient. So... When we're talking about point of care, thing, it's nothing new, of course, uh, as you can see, uh, like the, the, the doctor who's, who's looking at this, the urine, the bowl with the urine. Uh, you can regard it as every test at the point of care, but if you look at the, all the definitions, we made one ourselves after some consensus with clinical pathologists and microbiologists and GPs, and we called it a process, and the, the words uh, are stressed, which are now very important. It's not like doing a, a, a rapid test. It's a process and all the elements in the chain should be uh, uh, right, should be of high quality. And then it will profit the healthcare professional and the patient during the consultation with the patient. 
Uh, we also did a, a scientific job to uh, gather the opinion of many experts on how, what do you call a, a point of care test with a Delphi procedure. Uh, and there you, you see it, it, it is a test to support clinical decision making and to help the patient and physicians to decide upon management. I think these are quite important elements and also stresses the importance of quality insurance and pay for patient safety and for better uh, diagnostic care. So uh, like already said, uh, I'm part of the special interest group of uh, the Global Family Doctor Organization, Wonka, where we have this point of care testing group. And please feel free as a GP or as a primary care researcher to join us. You see the, uh, the mail address later on. And in my last slide, I will repeat that uh, mail uh, uh, link. So uh, you can just passively join. Uh, we are going to start up a, a Wonka communication platform so we can share thoughts, ideas, questions, and uh, papers to help address uh, point of care testing challenges. For now, we're just uh, opening to see who are the members and we make some plans later on. Uh, but it is on a low profile, but I think with the communication platform, it's more globally accessible. So feel free to join. So one word about the Dutch GP system, we call it huisarts. Um, um, we can say in, in the Netherlands, we have a very strong position, not only as the gatekeeper to be referred to secondary care, to the hospital, but also because we do uh, a lot of things uh, ourselves, like, like uh, surgery with all kinds of um, uh, elements uh, of primary care. We have continu continuity of care. That means that we have listed patients. So we are really family doctors. We know the families from birth, birth to death often. Uh, we are paid by a combination of fee for services and per capitation. And uh, we are regarded to have low costs and have good quality of care. And we have a strong organization for guidelines. We have over 100 primary care guidelines, which is very important if you think of point of care testing, uh, because it's not only about the quality of the test, but how to select the patient for the test and when not to perform point of care testing, for example. Well, societal developments are the aging population and huh, the problem and a strong substitution from secondary care to primary care that makes us even more busy. And it also means that we will do more diagnostics every day. Um, so we see the decentralization of diagnostic but also of, of, of chronic care. There's an emphasis on more digitalization but I have to admit and that's why it's in between brackets. It's not that easy to get good uh, quality um, uh, aid of, of uh, well, let's say internet care for the moment. But for sure, point of care testing will be there and will be much stronger in the coming years. So for today, I would like to hopefully to inspire you with a concrete example, which I experienced myself. I've been through this challenge for the last, uh, well, let's say 12 years. And I will share uh, this example because it also is the introduction to the introduction of laboratories in, uh, in co collaboration with primary care field. So the Dutch example. So uh, I was wondering when I was a junior doctor, why do we prescribe so much uh, antibiotics, uh, particularly in, in family care, because 80% um, of all human antibiotics are prescribed by GPs mostly for lower respiratory tract infections. And we know that most of those infections are acute bronchitis, which hardly need any antibiotic at all. So I thought, what if we could come up with a, let's say predictive model that we could reduce many unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions and, and establish what are the factors to differentiate pneumonia or severe infection from non-severe infections. So this is the end result. This is one of my actual patients. He was always getting an antibiotic three, four times a year when he was coughing a little bit. He had COPD, but when I met him, he was not so ill. He was coughing a little bit. And I heard a lot of noise on his lungs, but he had also uh, uh, tuberculosis in his youth. So I uh, proposed him now just to take a drop of blood 
and to see if he really needs this antibiotic. And this became the success of point of care testing in the Netherlands. And uh, this is how, uh, what the reaction was of the patient. And I hope you can hear it. And toen heeft hij met het apparaatje wat hij heeft, het is een apparaatje, hij, hij prikt je je vinger. En dan het in een, ik noem het dan maar even, een, een apparaatje. En na drie minuten weet hij of jij een longontsteking hebt of iets anders. Nou, echt om zo te kijken natuurlijk, hè. This is the reaction we often get from patients that makes this inspires doctors and practice nurses and assistants to continue with point of care testing. And it was another patient. Yes, it was my, me myself. It was after I produced my thesis on pneumonia. I got the pneumonia myself two months later. And what was striking that again, also on auscultation and sputum culture, blood cultures, they didn't find an answer why I was that ill. And the initial chest radiograph was also negative, but CRP was very high. And of course I had fever. Um, why is this happening? Why does our stethoscope not always help? Well, maybe it's because of this. We learn about low burn pneumonias in the textbooks you see below. Uh, and we know that antibiotics are needed for those pneumonias. But often in, in, in primary care, particularly, we see those more discrete pneumonias. And then you can imagine it's hardly to diagnose them properly at an early phase. And it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's not feasible to take chest radiographs for every patient. And if you do, you must uh, take into account that even the radiologists have problems diagnosing pneumonia uh, uh, if it comes to those primary care pneumonia cases. So we did, we, we looked upon all the signs and symptoms to diagnose pneumonia better. And what we found was CRP is by far the strongest predictor of pneumonia, particularly with low test results, you can exclude pneumonia. You have to add it on to after your history taking physical exam. And then we will say, you have to do it at the point of care to change actual management. And despite the fact that we like those ROC curves, like 100% sensitive and specific tests, um, CRP is not that, uh, that good. But if you compare it to the symptoms and signs you now uh, have from your patient, it's much better. And the, the, the red, the, the, that's the blue line. And then the black line is the line for fever and you see that CRP is much better, even after introducing it, after uh, history taking a physical exam. So other researchers found the same result and uh, CRP is often called a sensitive and non-specific test, but in hands of a care professional, he makes it specific. He knows if the patient is coughing or has abdominal pain. So it's a powerful tool for severity of illness. Uh, so what we did, we thought, okay, now we know it's a good tool, and now we have to see if we put that into practice, would that lead to less antibiotic prescriptions? We also included a second intervention, intervention about communication skills, how to address the problem of the patient. And what we found is that both interventions uh, caused a reduction of antibiotic prescribing. And if you add the two together, it leads to 25% reduction of antibiotic prescriptions. The same was found by a pan-European study and quite recently also for exacerbations of COPD. And I was very happy to be part of this last in the, in the lower uh, right part. It's, that's just another RCT on vulnerable elderly with all kinds of comorbidities. And still it was patient safe and led to the same reduction of antibiotic prescribing. And if you know that the Holland is a very low prescribing country, this holds promise for other countries globally. Well, it's all uh, summarized in, in various papers and Cochrane studies. And what we did is also compare the devices. Uh, are they good enough to be used? And actually they were. Uh, so we introduced it in our guidelines and selective cases to use a CRP test in this way. And I followed, uh, we followed up um, the guidelines and also saw that uh, the other guidelines came up with the same ideas. Even the South African guideline I just found out has included CRP as a useful tool, particularly in primary care. 
So why is the what's the power? I, I would I would say we can reduce uh, many antibiotics prescriptions if the test result is low. You see on the right part that's already 65 percent of the patients. This was true for our trials, but also 10 years later, it's still the same. So what we did is we did all kinds of activities to address this solution uh, to all kinds of stakeholders. We did implementation studies. And part of it is that I went to the laboratory world and I said, okay, you have to join me. We have to collaborate and make this happen. Why should I need a laboratory? Well, this is one of the answers. You see a point of care testing device next to a heater in a particular practice without laboratory support. And this harms quality for sure. So we won't, don't want to end like this to finish this uh, in, in implementation phase by just installing some devices. Uh, and of course, this is true for many uh, different subjects. Uh, the pre-analytic phase is very important if it comes to the quality of point of care testing, as you can see at the urine bottles here, brought to primary care offices by patients. So please, laboratories, that's my invitation to the microbiologists and the pathologists, please step forward enter primary care, take control of point of care testing, but at least facilitate. Don't say it will not work outside of, of the hospital because we have proven that it can work very properly. Um, so that's what we did with our lab. We um, have, I think, more than 2000 uh, uh, GPs now who take our services and we installed 400 point of care testing sites together with the PUCT, dedicated PUCT team. And what we do is we connect all those devices, we train all the users, and we can see who is making an error at a certain point and what kind of error it is. Is it a technical error? Is it a user error? And we uh, address this as soon as possible so that we don't compromise patient care. To do this, I had uh, asked uh, my colleagues from clinical pathology and micro microbiologists in the lab world and the GPs to come together and we made this guideline, which is basically on those uh, key points mentioned there, uh, following ISO norms, but also uh, using the general practice norms. That means you, you need to find a balance uh, to make it workable in, in GP care. But connectivity is one of the issues and we use kind of software to uh, address this so that we can act on, on errors and uh, give quality data. In this way, we see, well, I don't go into detail here, but uh, you can see that we send the personal data separately from the test result data. Uh, and those um, personal data are connected with the device via a barcode. And then it's sent to the laboratory information system that makes the laboratory uh, possible to reimburse the test costs at the insurance companies. And with the money, we take control of quality at the, at the point of care and GP offices. That means that the GPs has no costs at all. They don't have to buy the devices, don't have to buy the, the, the tests, they don't have to take care of all the logistic parts, but of course they have to take care of quality assurance issues together with the lab. So in this way, we could say we addressed all the topics, but to reach a broader impact, of course, we need to do it in many countries if it comes to uh, antimicro antimicrobial resistance problems. Uh, the Netherlands as, as one of the lower prescribing. Again, uh, if there are any initiatives, feel free to contact me and to try to set up something in Africa to reduce many unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Uh, we did a small feasibility study in Tigray area in Ethiopia. Uh, we also went to uh, Sudan, actually. And what we saw was quite surprising. What we knew is that there were uh, antibiotics there and almost as the only drug, actually, in these uh, um, remote areas. Uh, but what we saw, and this is um, inspiring, that also in the Ethiopian population, in remote areas, most patients had a very low test result. Again, like this 65 or 66% of patients, that means then you could, could withhold antibiotics, but then you need to have some 
well, uh, influence on cultural aspects and on reassuring patients that they don't need this antibiotic this time. And of course, there are more challenges if it comes to other diagnoses with a coughing patient in pro uh, primarily in Africa. So we have uh, addressed the problem. Uh, we have addressed some possible solutions, and that means that could be helpful to really change behavior of doctors and nurses in primary, primary care. Many other topics possible to mention, but this was the example why it's uh, uh, PUCT went on in primary care in the Netherlands. And actually we're now busy with automatic urine analysis, but also with professional glucose testing. If, if you talk, talk about mistakes, we have a, a very important mistake made in the hospitals by taking an orange as a nurse first and then uh, tr tracking the glucose of a patient. Probably the, the, the sugar of the orange, orange was mixed. Really? Not of the sugar, yes. Any question? No. Uh, so many um, uh, things to do if it comes to quality. HbA1c, very important. Uh, we have now installed HbA1c as well because the patients are, are, are very positive about their experiences. What we also saw when we introduced too many devices, it went wrong. They said there were too many devices, it's a small lab, we can't handle all the differences. So there's still a lot of things to do before we can have a, an overall um, yeah, point of care testing management for different diseases and problems. D-dimer is an important uh, example, which we will introduce very soon. And before there was this huge problem of uh, deciding which patient needs a test and then the actual performance of the test went wrong many times because it took too much blood. Um, so we started studies to compare the new generation of devices and I think they were very promising, promising to introduce D-dimer testing for lung embolism and thrombosis problems uh, very soon. So in general, speak, generally speaking, if you think about diagnostic testing for the future, um, then I think there will be a decentralization uh, for sure, but also the central lab will be uh, equally important still. And we've seen a rise of laboratory testing in the last 15 years, um, and this will go on for sure. And then there was this COVID pandemic, of course, and this has led to new thoughts and new ideas of many stakeholders also outside the medical field, uh, which can be very powerful um, uh, to introduce new tests which are needed maybe in your country. Uh, and this could be a, a, a line to think of. And yes, when powerful people uh, um, also promote these uh, tests, it can be uh, very profitable for all of us. And if, the doctors won't do it or the laboratory won't do it. I will, it will be the patients themselves in the future. But we have to take care of quality, particularly of self-tests and all kinds of new initiatives. Of course, strep A tests are already there for many years and also used in many countries in Europe, not in the Netherlands actually, um, but uh, also a very uh, powerful tool to address problems of unnecessary antibiotic prescribing. And we will get to an emergency lab. I think in five years time, we have a top 20 emergency lab test available within our primary care office, at least in some Western European countries, but maybe even quicker in African countries. Uh, so for our lab, we tried all kinds of devices and all kinds of pilots and studies, and some worked out quite well, some were not that user-friendly, which is very important. It should be dummy-proof, uh, very user-friendly to be uptaken by primary care. So are we there for point-of-care testing? Well, not at all. We're not at the, we don't have the perfect technology yet. We have too many devices with too many different procedures, and... Everything what can go wrong will go wrong if you don't control it. So this is an important subject. And unless you want to drive like this, uh, 
you uh, we, we are ready uh, with point of care testing. There are some bad examples, of course, and we know probably the story of Theranos, of Elizabeth Holmes, uh, trying to invent, uh, uh, trying to do 200 over, over 200 tests with one single drop of blood. Uh, but, uh, and there will be uh, a new fakes and new bad uh, examples of, of point of care testing devices, but that's why the labs are important also to try to find out and to validate or uh, to see if this device is, is workable technically, also a cure accurate. And then the primary care world also has to decide in, in primary care studies if it adds value to your daily routine care. So many challenges to overcome. Of course, we have, as a doctor, we are quite conservative most of the time. So to change your behavior takes effort, takes time, uh, particularly when you like the, the old way of, uh, well, auscultating the lungs of a patient, like you see in the left. Uh, you shouldn't distract yourself with a technical test result from the main uh, part of your consultation. And that is that you look upon to the patient, that you talk with the patient and, and do research on the patient to decide on what's needed next. Of course, there are issues on, on uh, if it comes to reimbursement and quality insurance, we address that. And um, um, for sure, we need to keep thinking before we just decide to do a test to help a patient. But on the other hand, there is a great technology push at the moment. I see, I speak to a lot of startup companies with very delicate uh, uh, technical improvements, uh, talking about um, microfluidic, nanofluidic techniques. That means that it will be available in much lower prices in the future to do a, a proper diagnostic test. But there's also this industry hesitation also from the bigger companies, I have to, uh, have to say, the bigger diagnostic companies, which who also have these large uh, uh, lab devices. Uh, so they are a little bit in doubt if they should move on with point of care testing. Then we have this also some conservative thoughts of microbiologists and clinical pathologists themselves. Uh, do we need to extend our work outside our central lab? Uh, but on the other hand, there's this great patient push uh, and I think more and more acceptance of quality assured point of care testing in primary care. So when I asked the GPs in the Netherlands already in 2012, would you like to have a device which could do this, these tricks the answer was already that 88% uh, said yes, and now it is even higher, 96% uh, of, the, of the doctors say, well, give me this device, where can I get it? And let's start doing it. If it comes to microbiology testing, the enthusiasm, uh, for example, to, to diagnose influenza was not high in the Netherlands at all, but because of COVID, this is almost doubled in percentage now. And of course, for uh, countries suffering from malaria uh, problems, HIV, tuberculosis, I think it will be also very interesting to have high accurate um, point of care tests. So I think we're moving into this direction that you get a all in one device with difficult different panels and you can choose what to use for a specific patient. And I don't like panel testing in itself, so don't test everything. You have to have a clear question where you get your clear answer for. Um, and students go on uh, making new technology possible. And I'm sure our patients would really love to take part of that and to, uh, to be the users of a good point of care test. So I would like to thank uh, for this time to show you at least, I hope, uh, a, an example of how it could work and how it has worked in the Netherlands uh, and will continue uh, for the next uh, years. And I've met many people from uh, surrounding countries and uh, countries globally who would really would take on with this important subject. Thank you so much. Again, right below you see the special interest group point of care, you can join. And uh, well, thanks and uh, I'm ready for questions.
But uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hofstaken, for that very um, elucidating and interesting uh, presentation of a very important topic, uh, the point of care testing um, as is practiced in your country. Um, there is no doubt that there's uh, a lot of information there that uh, those of us in practice in Africa can learn from and hopefully want to uh, emulate. Um, once again, thank you very much for that uh, thought provoking uh, presentation, uh, full of facts and uh, especially backed by uh, the research, um, uh, especially in these days of uh, evidence based practice. It was important to see that uh, you did not only propound um, a theory, you went ahead to um, show how it works. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Now, um, before we have the next speaker, we, we call for um, questions from the participants. Um, I'm not sure what I can see here. Yeah, we have some 23 participants in the house, and I hope you had uh, been taking notes when uh, the speaker was making his presentation. Um, we are open now for just a few minutes of questions and hopefully would we'll receive answers from uh, Dr. Hofstaken. Questions, please, from the audience. If you could um, indicate by um, raising your hand. Um, We're open for questions and answers on the first presentation. Maybe I should kick off. Uh, the first second, in your extensive work that you've done in your country, um, do you have anything to say about the costs? Uh, the, the point of care testing reduced the costs overall. Because in Africa, we have a huge problem with health funding anyway. Uh, one way to convince our policymakers that this is the way to go might be if we could show to them that it uh, not only is it convenient and uh, aids uh, diagnosis and treatment, but that it's also cost effective. Right. It's a very important uh, quest question, uh, of, of course. Um, what we've seen scientifically we could prove that, for example, this CRP test is cost effective. Um, on the other hand, if you want to install quality assurance aside to uh, just uh, handing over a point of care test, that takes effort, time and money from, in this case, a laboratory field. Now, we are quite lucky, you could say, that we have a kind of competing market between laboratories. That means that they would really like the to give service to their clients, the primary care physicians. That means that they are willing to uh, invest in this development a little bit more than average. Uh, at the same time, we have insurance companies who uh, will um, um, uh, facilitate uh, reimbursement when the test is in a, a guideline, official guideline, which is the case for a few tests currently, like the glucose test and the urine test, uh, but also for, for um, uh, CRP, uh, uh, for example. So it is important to address the scientific issues uh, to give the, the, the clear message that we, are, that we have scientific proof that it adds value to, to primary care. And then I hope that stakeholders also um, talking about huge uh, other issues uh, find it inter interesting and also very attractive to, uh, to spend some resources on, on this new development um, because I think it's unstoppable and you can replace uh, costs now performed at the central lab for uh, uh, point of care uh, lab tests and uh, to, to replace those costs, which is in the same line actually. So it's not like a very expensive uh, new way, uh, particularly not if laboratories or other stakeholders like the government would like to invest a little bit in, uh, in these new devices. 
And I know for the newer companies, uh, I think one, one of them is Lumira to mention, they have much lower costs of the devices and the tests. So that could be very helpful also for African countries with remote control on connectivity. Uh, so um, yeah, there are uh, um, big challenges still, um, but hopefully um, we have seen at least it is feasible to introduce it in some African uh, countries. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. The floor is still open for more questions. Is there any coming? Okay. Um, I can't see any hands up, so we'll move to our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Erasmus Rajiv, and he's going to talk to us on uh, point of care testing. Management in Africa starts with institution of point of care testing policies, control and logistics. Um, just a minute, I just lost my, uh, hold on. Uh, Messi, can you take on from there? I just lost my contact, my connection. Sorry. I'm also having problems here. Yeah, Messi. Um, Messi, can you carry on, please? I just lost my contact. I don't know if you can hear me. Hello, Joseph. Hi, Joseph. I still have contact with you, uh, Professor Erasmus. Um, yeah, but I've, I've lost contact with uh, the rest of the team. Right. And I can't share. Um, if you if you go with your cursor to below, sometimes it pops up 
automatically to share screen. Did you yes, I did that. I did the share screen, which I'm doing now, share screen. Right. And then it says entire screen, Windows, Chrome tab. Um, this is something new to me. It shouldn't really appear. And then I, I put this, uh, I say, okay, uh, I go into the Windows and then I say share and, and nothing appears. Hmm. So my, my talk is open. I've okay. opened my talk, but, but I can't. You can't see it. I can't hear it. Uh, and, and, and is it possible to uh, decrease the size of your screen to that you see your own PowerPoint okay, slides? Or something? Uh, let's see if I can decrease the size here. Let's see. I'm, I'm not sure. Can, can you see it now? You no, know? no. No? No. So that's that's my PowerPoint. I can see it here, mm. but you can't see it. Yeah? No. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, we can see you and hear you. Yeah, my line is very it's just it's hopeless. Uh, but I, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. One of the challenges of. Uh, <laughs> hmm. yeah, so, Dr. Raji, uh, Professor Raji. Yeah, I, I'm having uh, problems in 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 um, in uh, um, sharing the screen. I've tried it. Um, it doesn't go through here. I'm sh sharing the screen again. Okay. Um, uh, let me see. Can you see me there? No. No, no. It's, not, it's not coming. Uh, you may have to do a presentation without uh, sharing them. OK. OK, now that's that's a pity. That's a pity. Can you see me now? No? No, no we still can't see you. OK, let me just uh, go to. So uh, there's see. no one, no one of the organization, uh, not anymore, eh? because she had maybe your slides as well, hasn't she? Yes, she does have my slides. I've All right, my... Mercy. Mercy, yeah. Yes. But she's gone, I think. She's gone. Oh. Uh, let me just see whether I can go back to. Uh, she's not in this meeting. Mm. Uh, let's see if I can, you see, that's the share screen. Um, and and uh, let's see, it says um. share and um, I say micro and, and, and that's. Yeah, Messi is not here. So I suspect you, because we're losing, uh, people are dropping out. So it might be an idea to. Can, can you see me now? No. Nothing is no. happening. Nothing is nothing is happening. Okay. Okay. I. Okay. So let me just uh, start the talk. Sorry about that. Uh, that's a pity. Yeah. Um, that, that's a pity. Um, so um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, my name is uh, Rajiv Erasmus, um, and I'm going to be talking on point of care testing management in Africa starts with institution of point of care testing policies, quality control and logistics. And I'm based uh, in the Faculty of Medicine at Tigerberg Hospital, which is with Stellenbosch University in Cape Town. And uh, I'm an emeritus professor in the Department of Chemical Pathology with the, with the uh, Faculty of Medicine. So what I will talk about is what is point of care testing, and I think uh, Roger has already talked about it. What are its benefits? I will just show some examples of point of care testing instruments, which unfortunately you can't see. And then I will talk about quality management of point of care testing and accreditation. And then talk about 
the tool that we have developed, which we call as the 8R tool, which is important for quality, especially for, for nurses, and then how we can use connectivity to improve and manage quality of uh, point of care testing instruments. So let's begin by talking on what is point of care testing and what are its benefits. I think Roger has already said, uh, given us a very good definition, and it is important for us to be aware that there are multiple definitions, but one of the most common uh, definition of point of care testing is that it is usually done outside the lab using small handheld or benchtop instruments. But it's also important to realize that whilst they say that it's done outside the lab, it can be done, uh, in fact, anywhere. And indeed, it can also be done in the lab uh, uh, sometimes. For example, at the Aga Khan Hospital, uh, where I, I frequently visit in Nairobi, many times when they do, when their systems are down in the main lab, they actually use point of care instruments to service the patients. One of the big advantages of uh, point of care testing is is that it allows for more rapid clinical decision making in the process of diagnosis. So it can be used as uh, for ruling or for ruling out a particular condition. And because of the fast turnaround time, it helps the physician in making uh, a quick diagnosis. And obviously this has an impact on treatment as well as operational decision-making and resource utilization. So uh, we all know, and I think uh, uh, Roger has alluded to, there are clear pros and cons to point of care testing versus lab testing. But there is no doubt that in the last decade, there is a big move to decentralize uh, lab tests um, and, and particularly in, in Africa, it has found great use. And uh, we all know that there are certain situations where point of care testing can provide a definite advantage to the treating clinician. Uh, it might also have minimal risk, better cost savings, and lead to a quality healthcare experience for the patient. And you saw the picture that Roger showed uh, where the patient was saying that you just put a drop of blood and the physician within five minutes or 10 minutes can tell you what you have. So that's the response uh, from, the, from the patient. However, uh, there is no doubt that uh, in certain, as I pointed out earlier, certain uh, situations and scenarios, um, especially in the emergency room, the operating theater, um, uh, in cases where you have disasters, point of care testing has a definite advantage over tests that are sent or samples that are sent to the lab. Now, uh, you can't see the picture, um, but in this, in this slide, I'm showing you different types of point of care instruments, which I think many of you are familiar with, and many of them can do blood gases, they can do coagulation tests. Uh, you're all familiar with glucose and ketone testing meters. Uh, Roger talked about A1C, but one of the very common tests that has, that has been used for more than two decades is the pregnancy, uh, pregnancy tests. Um, and in Africa, uh, a lot of uh, point of care testing is done for hemoglobin. Um, and so we have a lot of hemoglobin uh, devices that can do your hemoglobin for anemia. And, and we know that anemia is very common in Africa. In the last decade, of course, there have been point of care tests for HIV, for malaria, for syphilis. And uh, in the last two years, uh, we've had lots of point of care testing done for COVID. Uh, especially with antibody and, anti and, and, and uh, antigen testing. And indeed, you even now have point of care uh, instruments for molecular testing. 
In fact, at Tigerberg Hospital in South Africa, we are actually using uh, uh, point of care testing for breast cancers, for, for picking up uh, certain types of breast cancer. Now, my next slide again is very pictorial and it shows you the variety of methods and technologies being used for point of care instruments. So many of these instruments can be either standalone devices and they can be connected to smartphones. Um, Roger talked about the microfluidic uh, multiplex devices and these devices use uh, very small amounts of, of, of your blood. And so they are very, very uh, suitable for pediatric uh, patients. Some of these devices use a variety of um, uh, technologies um, and amongst which you have cartridge-based devices. Um, you also have uh, uh, micro pads um, and, and uh, many of these uh, devices can be improved by having uh, attachments put onto them which enable the instrument to be connected to other devices or to the uh, lab information system or even to the hospital information system. So um, there is no doubt that there are lots of advantages of point of care testing. And one of the major advantages, of course, we have alluded to it, is the fast turnaround time. But the other advantages uh, of point of care instruments is that they are transportable. In other words, you can carry them with you. Um, and many of the tests that are done are disposable. Uh, so some of them are done in a cartridge or they are in the form of a strip, which you can do the test and then you can throw it away. Um, some of them have a very small footprint. And because of that small footprint, uh, they can be carried around and uh, several of these point of care instruments are handheld and of course we've mentioned about the ease of uh, performing these tests as well as the fact that they ha you have a result ready in a short period of time. One of the other advantages of point of care testing is that um, in many of the uh, point of care instruments the sample volume that is used is extremely uh, small and, and, and you don't have and, and many of the, the um, tests are not invasive in the sense that you don't have to take a syringe and a needle and then poke the patient to collect uh, the sample and then send off to the lab. So point of care instruments have a definite advantage over the traditional way of collecting your blood sample. Now the next uh, slide actually shows a picture of a remote uh, village in, in, uh, in Africa. And uh, indeed, uh, just to share uh, what this picture is, is saying, is that point of care is well suited to Africa where health centers are located in sparse areas such as what is being shown in this slide, which you can't see. And advances in connectivity that have taken place in the last five years, and Africa is rapidly catching up, they allow for instant messaging of results and managing of point of care testing from centralized labs. So connectivity is playing a big role in, in, uh, in Africa where point of care instruments that are located in, in rural or primary health care uh, settings can link up through this connectivity with the main lab. And the quality of those results can be monitored by the main lab. Now in Africa, uh, in particular, point of care testing is particularly uh, welcome because in many parts of Africa, the workforce um, is less than one lab professional per 10,000 people. Um, with respect to quality of labs, it is well known that less than 500 labs are accredited to international standards 
and more than 90% of these accredited labs are in fact in South Africa. And you will realize that South Africa is only one of 55 countries in Africa. Furthermore, uh, we have very few functional national public health reference labs and networks in Africa. So therefore, in, in, in the African setting, point of care testing is well suited to the African environment. So we know that the reality of low resource settings such as that you find in, in Africa is that there is limitation in health infrastructure, the facilities are crowded, uh, there's irregular power and water supply. And as I mentioned earlier on, we have limitation in human resources. And therefore, there is a big need for quality, simple to use diagnostic uh, and, and uh, diagnostic instruments needed to assure rapid, effective treatment. And this is where your point of care testing is particularly suited for the African uh, environment. And we know that, that in many African settings, um, many primary healthcare settings are, are situated in low resource settings, many of which are in rural areas. And this is what this slide is showing. So it's showing you a village uh, where people are just standing around a health clinic and, uh, and you can actually see that this is in a rural setting where the primary health care facility is located. Now, in uh, more than a decade ago, um, it was felt and it was actually uh, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine that Africa needs to rethink uh, it's a diagnostics, especially in view of the fact that there is a brain drain. There are very few uh, lab professionals. The labs are not uh, accredited. The quality is poor. And it was felt more than a decade ago that point of care testing would be a, would be a clear uh, uh, alt uh, alternative to lab testing. And in that article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was published in 2013, they actually talked about four key areas of improvement in health systems. And one of the things that was talked about was revised policy and normative guidance, improved operational systems, and decentralization of diagnostics. And this is where point of care testing was felt to, to, uh, to be promoted in the African uh, um, uh, um, communities. And therefore that article proposed at that time that everything should be reorganized with respect to patient care and diagnostics using a point of care testing model. Following uh, that uh, publication of, the, of that article in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Africa Society of Lab Medicine, realizing the importance of point of care testing, especially in African uh, settings and environments, they had a huge conference uh, on, on it. And they then pointed out that systems must be developed in Africa to embrace rather than reject point of care testing in Africa. However, we know that for point of care testing to be successful and uh, uh, in, in the African environment, it's, it must have an effective quality management system. This is critical because clinicians need reassurance that their decisions are based on reliable, accurate, and precise results to ensure that patient safety is not compromised. So the situation in much of Africa is that though point of care testing is being carried out, however, the reliability and the quality of the results that are being produced, um, one is not sure about that quality because there is no monitoring system in many of the primary healthcare centers where such testing 
is being carried out. Now, um, um, there have been several quality control concerns regarding the performance of point of care tests, uh, especially in, uh, in rural environments. Um, and, it, and it's just not limited just to rural environments. It's actually happening even in urban environments and even in big hospitals where point of care testing is being carried out. And in 2009, Plebani et al. actually published a set of 10 uh, important uh, features uh, that have been noted uh, with respect to point of care testing. And these included that many of the operators who were performing these tests was, were failing to perform quality control uh, uh, processes. They were also failing to document any quality control that was being done. Many of them were not following manufacturer's instructions. They did not have any procedure manuals. Um, they were not documenting uh, uh, personnel training and, and competency assessment, both of which are very important for ensuring the quality of your point of care uh, results. Um, he also pointed out in that paper that many operators were not calibrating the instruments and there was no corrective action for any quality control uh, outliers. He further pointed out that in many uh, areas or many uh, settings, there was no continuing, uh, continuing uh, education of point of care uh, operators. And of course, we know that whilst this was published uh, in, in, in uh, studies from Europe, that many of these issues that Plebani uh, alluded to, they are actually amplified in Africa, particularly in primary uh, care and rural. Uh, and so uh, in, uh, in 2015, the, the World Health Organization published a set of uh, guidance for point of care operators in, in, in Africa in, in particular. And one of the things they said was that whenever you want to introduce point of care testing in Africa, you need to check what are the environmental conditions uh, for carrying out those tests. Because we know that many of the strips are affected by temperature and humidity. And this, this is one of the things that is frequently ignored especially in African uh, 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 settings. And then what they've also found out was that particular attention should be paid to the transcription of results because there were a lot of clerical errors that were taking, pl uh, taking place in African settings. And so uh, the next slide actually talks about what are the quality requirements and regulatory compliance that must take place when point of care testing is being used to, uh, to, to diagnose uh, for specific conditions uh, uh, using these uh, instruments. And I think Roger did allude to the ISO 15189, which is an international standard that has been used by, by main labs but this has been complemented by the ISO 22870, which is specific, uh, which gives you the specific requirements applicable to point of care testing um, when it is being used um, in medical labs in accordance with the ISO 15189 standard. So the question is how many uh, how many primary health care settings uh, or clinics or even GPs uh, in, in Africa are actually using these standards to guide the quality of their testing. Now, the requirements of the ISO 22870 apply when a point of care test is performed in a hospital, clinic, or a healthcare organization 
providing ambulance care. Now, the evidence that we have in Africa is that many uh, of the settings that are using point of care testing, in fact, are, in, are ignorant of these standards. So the WHO has embarked, and that is my next slide, in educating uh, point of care testing uh, organizations and operators about what is meant by a continuous quality assurance and improvement process. And they talk about three phases in which you try to first plan your services and how you, you then go on to implement your services and then you have what we call as a quality assurance cycle, which ensures the quality of the results produced and with, into that is linked uh, an improvement cycle in which you are continually improving the training of your personnel, the quality of your, your, your testing, the, the, um, the, the safety procedures that need to be uh, used to ensure that a quality result is given to the clinician. So in the next uh, slide, uh, again taken from the WHO, it talks about a quality framework. In other words, a framework that should be considered when introducing point of care uh, uh, tests in any environment. And it starts with putting up a policy in which you first assess whether in fact a point of care test is needed. And this policy then talks about the stakeholder engagement. In other words, all the parties involved in putting up that point of care test should be aware of, uh, of, 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 uh, of how the test should be carried out, where it should be carried out, what are the logistics, who will pay for what, um, uh, the, the, the supply chain, and so on. And one of the issues that that is so important there is what we call as the governance of the of the whole process. And then it talks about strategy and planning, uh, which respect to your operational plans, the diagnostic network mapping, and then whether in fact a regulatory approval is uh, is required because we do know that there is what we call as global regulations, but the national uh, regulations might differ and that needs to be taken into account and put into practice. And this is something that we don't see uh, being observed in much of Africa. And then there's the other issue of, of procurement and supply chain management. And this is a huge issue in, in Africa especially in primary care settings, where in fact um, the, the, the supply chain is disrupted and very often your reagents are not transported appropriately to these sites. So the next slide just shows you what entails or what should happen when a point of care test is being introduced. And it starts with evaluating if there is a need it then talks on method performance. Does that particular test perform well in those conditions? What are the procedures that are established? Is documentation being carried out? Has staff training been carried out? And, and then it talks about the clinical practice. If in fact the results that are being uh, generated are making an impact on the diagnosis of that particular uh, condition, and if in fact it is leading to an improvement in patient outcomes. So both the testing as well as the patient outcomes are very much entwined to ensure that uh, proper use is being made of the results that are generated in the uh, in, in the primary healthcare environment. And here I will give you an example. Five years ago, we, we introduced A1C um, in, in, in a primary healthcare setting. And what we found out 
was that introducing the A1C testing for, for managing and monitoring patients with diabetes was in fact not very effective and cost effective in that environment because many of the primary health care uh, physicians or doctors were not acting on the results that were being given uh, to them uh, following the, the test. So it is very, very important that the two go hand in hand. And specific, uh, this next slide just shows you specific areas that need attention, which include, and I've already talked about the governance, the policies, what one of the very important things is, what is the risk or, and, and uh, with respect to quality management of putting a point of care instrument in a primary healthcare setting? Do you, for example, have uh, any training being done? Are there any protocols that are being followed? Uh, what, what is the, the uh, logistics of your supply management? Um, is the site that you have chosen appropriate? And um, I have pictures here which you can't see where the sites uh, don't have water, for example. They don't have air conditioning. They, it's very hot. Uh, there's not even a table to, to, uh, to put your, your um, uh, there's no fridge, for example, to store your uh, reagents. Now, specific areas that have been found that need attention in a primary health care setting is the finger pricking technique, um, avoiding delays in putting the sample onto the strip, avoiding clots, say, for example, in your blood gas machines, um, documenting uh, the results. This is a frequent problem in your primary health care settings. So the other question that is very important is that, is there a management team? Um, are procedures being documented as I, talk, as I said earlier on? And according to the ISO 22870, a point of care management group should be set up. And this group is responsible for the quality management strategy and implementation of a staff training program. And then how many sites are actually accredited? Now, can we allow a proliferation of point of care testing when there is no accreditation? Should the results of uh, the results obtained from a point of care instrument, should, should they not have the same standard as the results produced from a traditional lab? So you can't really have two sets of standards and two sets of quality because the patient uh, deserves to have a test that is reliable, uh, that is accurate, and that has undergone specific quality assurance programs. So um, many of the international organizations are concerned uh, about the quality of point of care tests that are being done in, in uh, rural health settings and elsewhere. And they have produced a set of guidelines, especially with respect to HIV and, and, and malaria and syphilis, which in fact can be applied to other point of care tests. And this is what the slide here is showing. And the WHO has produced what we call as the WHO Afro checklist that every point of care testing site must um, use. And these are 12 uh, checklists that are on this list that talk on documents, on management reviews, on the organization, on client management, equipment management, purchasing and inventory, corrective action, facilities and safety. Now, the question is, how many of these are being observed at our point of care testing sites in, in, uh, in, in the multiple sites that are, that are using point of care instruments? And uh, you will be surprised that many of these sites are not even aware of this checklist, uh, which is supposed to be observed. And then, there's the question of procedure manuals. How many of our point of care sites have procedure manuals? Now, these are very important because these procedure manuals describe patient preparation 
specimen requirements, safety procedures, and test uh, interpretation. So they are critical. Uh, uh, it's critical for our point of care operators to have them uh, and, and study them and use them to ensure the reliability of tests. Now, there have been several studies that have looked at the performance of point of care uh, operators. And, and what they have shown is that point of care uh, operators, if they are properly trained, uh, are actually producing results that are comparable to those given by the lab. So that's really a great thing. And the question, and there was a study that was done which, which, which questioned whether trained lay providers uh, can perform accurate HIV testing. And this was a systematic review that was done. And the evidence that came out suggested that if uh, operators are trained, um, they can actually be used to expand the HIV testing to more people in Africa. And now just to let you know that point of care testing is being used in many African settings. And, and so the results of this study are really gratifying that if the point of care operators are well trained, uh, they can actually give results that are comparable to those produced by main labs. So we did a study, this is the next uh, slide, and we almost to the end, um, where we looked at uh, clinical staff knowledge and awareness of point of care testing best practices at Tigerberg Hospital in Cape Town. Now, um, Tigerberg Hospital is a huge hospital of about 1,200 beds. And we were, we assessed the knowledge of uh, these point of care operators. And we were actually shocked to see that 22% of the operators had no idea of what quality uh, measures they must take. Another 47% um, um, uh, of them uh, were not uh, sure of the written, uh, written protocols. Um, many of them were unaware of the manufacturer um, uh, uh, manuals. They were not sure where they were kept. And we were also surprised to see that 28% of operators uh, were not aware that they need to that they need to store the record of results obtained from point of care instruments. So many of them were just putting the results on small sheets of paper and they will hand it over to the doctor and there was no record of what had been done. So we know that communication is very important uh, with nurses. And so we have developed what we call as a eight hour tool, eight hour tool, which is uh, aligned to the ISO 22870. And this is a very simple tool which allows nurses to remember what they must do when they are operating a point of care instrument. And this eight hour tool, as we call it, is grouped into three main themes that examine uh, the patient, the testing process, and the quality control and delivery of results. And the 8R tool refers to the eight items that the nurse must always remember when she or he is carrying out a point of care test. And it starts with the first one, is the right test ordered? Are you testing the right patient? Have you prepared the patient appropriately? Is the right specimen been taken? Has it ha, have the right procedures been followed? Has the Q quality control procedures been performed? Is the right test uh, result generated? And who has interpreted the test results? Has it been delivered? Has it been recorded? So these are the eight uh, things that nurses must keep in mind. And lastly, I will just talk on the role of connectivity. This has become a critical issue and this allows for uh, uh, results to be monitored 
Um, it allows for results and uh, uh, to be sent to a central information system. Uh, you can actually align it uh, with the patient's uh, uh, record. You can align it with the lab information system and all this information can be sent to the central information um, uh, system which aligns the results, the quality control, the type of sample, the training of the operators into one single dashboard such that the lab manager uh, can, or the coordinator can actually monitor the quality of your point of care uh, and, um, and results. And so the, one of the big issues is preventing errors in point of care testing. Now, uh, because we are running short of time, it has been shown that connectivity can in fact prevent some of these errors by monitoring the pre-analytic, the analytic and the post-analytic phases of your total testing process. So there is no doubt that point of care testing is changing lives in Africa. Connectivity, which has become available in the last five years, is having a huge impact because not only is quality control and supply chain being monitored, but in fact, this is being integrated with patient flow and, uh, and making sure that patients are adhering to their treatment. And this uh, is, is having a big impact on patient uh, outcomes. So um, uh, we also have the use of, of cell phones, which are now being used as readers, uh, where they can act, where they can actually take pictures of your results. And this can be uploaded and transmitted to a central site, which can actually uh, give some comments on the results received. So finally, has point of care testing improved clinical outcomes in Africa? In fact, there has been a systematic review on CD4 testing. And what they have found out is that point of care testing has dramatically improved uh, patient outcomes because of the dramatic decrease in the turnaround time, resulting in faster uh, treatment and, and also uh, uh, preventing the spread of HIV. So in conclusion, uh, for point of care testing to be effective in the primary healthcare setting, a well-managed quality management system should be in place for clinicians to have confidence in the test results. It is therefore critical that we have policies in place and to ensure that logistics and a governance structure are in place. So thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry that we could not project these slides. And I do hope this will have some impact uh, on, on, on the people who have attended in improving the quality of point of care testing in your own respective environment. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rasmus uh, Rajiv. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, let me, on behalf of Afro PHC, um, apologize profusely uh, for the failure of uh, technology. Um, it doesn't happen very often, uh, so we're, we're very sorry it uh, uh, it has uh, happened during your presentation. We hope, however, that we, the participants, um, have uh, imbibed and taken on board the um, very uh, illuminating points that you have made about point of care testing. Uh, we hope also that we have, even without your slides, um, been able to uh, assimilate the advantages and that you have eliminated why we need point of care testing spread across Africa. We apologize sincerely for the failure of the technology. Um, You've told us uh, quite a lot, really, and we want to thank you for that. Um, you, you've told us the, uh, why we need to have it, what is point of care testing, um, why it is useful, especially in an atmosphere where we have um, uh, severe human resource shortages. And while most of Africa is still a very rural quarter from um, 
demand centers where the labs are usually located. And as Afro PSC is uh, trying to project the importance of uh, primary health care, uh, you've they told us um, why it's important that um, that advocacy has to include uh, getting our policymakers and governments to appreciate the value of having uh, been able to conduct point of care testing in our uh, primary health care centers, quite often in difficult to reach areas and the health workers are cut off from the main centers and long distances from where the centers and uh, PSCs are located um, to where they have a lab. Uh, the, the fast turnaround time, the advantages, uh, the convenience of it, and the fact that um, it, it's, it's actually cost effective. Um, you also emphasize that um, it's important that we have a robust quality assurance um, around uh, the point of care testing so that the results that we get are similar to the results that we would not would expect if we were using a big lab. That's very, very important because if um, um, the point of care testing is not as effective as the big labs, then there's the, um, there's the risk of misdiagnosis and therefore mistreatment and therefore a poor outcome in the end. So th thank you very much. And once again, I want to apologize for the technical uh, hitches that we've had. However, um, I hope that we're 12 in the, uh, in, the, in, the part, in the meeting now. I hope we all have our questions ready. It's important, please, that we uh, pose our questions to uh, our presenters. Um, we may not have the opportunity of uh, getting from their wide experience. Um, the meeting, we're not open for questions, please, from the floor. Just show by a raise of hand. Yes, please. Professor Hobstacken, your hand is up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Erasmus. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, you did a great job uh, discussing all this without showing any slides. Uh, um, still, the message is clear. Uh, I was just wondering, because as a primary care physician, you might feel even more hurdles to start PUCT uh, in your own uh, vicinity after hearing to your talk, um, how can you uh, get over this, these big challenges if it comes to quality assurance and uh, the problem issues with that? Is there, for example, any incentive uh, for the laboratory uh, specialists uh, to be involved somehow, to reach out, to, to set a standard, to uh, show best cases, etc.? Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger. Uh, in fact, uh, what is happening in many African countries is that, first of all, policies are being put up. Um, and, and, and South Africa does have a policy. Um, Malawi, for example, has a policy. Zambia has a policy. The problem is the implementation of, of these policies. And I think that's the question that you are trying to, to, to ask. So what, what we are trying to do is to have more uh, training. Um, and I have personally organized workshops in different parts of Africa. We are making people more aware that point of care is not so simple because many administrators believe that because it's a, a small instrument, you can just uh, use it um, without any reference to quality control. So we are making uh, people aware of this through, uh, through, through, through these workshops. In the last uh, year, we have also put up a nine module training course for point of care testing in Africa. This is the first uh, uh, detailed course that is given over one week, not over five hours, but over one week. And it also has a practical session where we invite different companies to bring their products. Uh, so we have Abbott, we have Roche, we have Siemens, and each one is given an opportunity to, to talk about their instrument and actually have a 
practical, uh, practical demonstration in which uh, the students who participate uh, go through the whole process of, of uh, doing a point of care test. Um, and, and so uh, we are trying to, to, to do our own part in educating uh, the, the, the doctors and the, the nurses and so on. But it's a long battle. And I think as uh, accreditation requirements become more and more uh, stringent and become important, and the government realizes that point of care testing sites need to be accredited, accredited I think uh, then we are going to see a gradual improvement in the, in the quality of, uh, of, of, these, of these tests. But at the moment, we have had many cases, uh, even with COVID, and with HIV, uh, where people have been given uh, either false positive or false negative results, leading to catastrophic, uh, um, uh, um, you may say, outcomes. So uh, we know that uh, if we are going to use point of care testing, we need to ensure that the quality of, of course, we do know that many of these uh, uh, results can sometimes be false positive or false negative, not, not no one test is totally 100% sensitive and 100% specific. However, uh, we know that uh, mistakes continue to be, to be made. In fact, even the quality of sometimes the test kits is not right because they were never stored properly and as part of the transport chain. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions for Professor Rasmus, please? Uh, let me just check the chat and get the comment there. Uh, yeah, somebody is asking if we can have copies of your presentations, please, uh, both Professor Rasmus and uh, half second. Yes, so my, my presentation has been sent to Mercy. Okay. I sent it to her at about uh, four hours ago, three hours ago. So the presentation is there. Okay. Um, yeah. And just to, uh, uh, Joseph, to tell you that I was in Nigeria uh, many, many years ago. I did my training, medical training at UCH. I'm interested. That's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we had the first point of care instrument that uh, in 1979 when yes. i was a when i was a registrar at uch right. and we had we had a company called ames uh, that that manufactured the first glucometer and yes. uh, they actually brought it to nigeria uh, during in 1979 right. to have it introduced so point of care has been in nigeria for a very long time yeah. um, just to for you to be aware about that. Uh, it's, just that it's just that we don't have a, a quality uh, control monitoring system, and not just in Nigeria, but across the whole of Africa. Uh, even in South Africa, we don't, we don't have such a system hmm. like we have for, for, the, for the lab tests. Yes. So yes. We, we're actually working on that, and uh, hopefully, uh, it will be introduced to the rest of Africa, perhaps in the next five years. Yes. Well, that's that's that's, that's a very um, uh, interesting and um, exciting information to give to us. And uh, you hit the nail on the head when you say uh, we don't have um, uh, the quality assurance standards for monitoring this stuff. Um, in fact, it's a big issue in Nigeria at the moment that we are discussing across healthcare generally. Um, the lack of a national national standards uh, to define what every Nigerian should expect if they go to say a primary health center or go to a secondary uh, health facility or a teaching hospital. And uh, the lack of uh, the national standards uh, is, is a big problem, it's very topical, especially since we have, uh, we now have a national health act that was uh, signed into law in, uh, in 2014. Uh, so thank you very much for that information. Uh, the, the 70s era, we, see, we still see as uh, the golden era of healthcare in Nigeria, because at that point, there was very little brain drain. Uh, if anything, uh, we attracted um, both patients and, uh, uh, and uh, physicians to the country. Um, 
sadly that has that has changed in the in the 80s and the 90s so thank you very much for that um those of us still in the house and yeah uh somebody's hand is raised javis ravis your hand is raised please ravis please the floor is yours i hope i pronounced it right ravis your hand is raised You're recognized, please ask your question. You can unmute your phone, unmute your phone and ask your question, please. Ravis, mm. unmute, unmute and uh, speak to us, please. Mm. Must be having challenges, can't unmute. Uh, Ravis, can you unmute and, and ask your question? He still can't unmute. Yeah. Oh, okay, he says he can't unmute himself. Uh, well, sorry about that. Um, again, it's part of the technical hitches that we've had with this, uh, with this session. Um, if there are no other questions, um, what's left for me now is to thank on behalf of Afro PhD, uh, both our speakers, um, uh, Professor Hofstacken and Professor Erasmus, for the excellent job they've done with their topics. Um, I have learned a lot, and I hope we, the rest of us, have learned a lot as well. Um, we're very sorry for the uh, technical hitches, um, especially with uh, Professor Erasmus's presentation. Uh, it can be very disconcerting. And well, once you've done a lot of work to prepare your talk and only to find that uh, technical hitches prevents you from uh, presenting it. But even then, we have to thank him very much for even though we didn't see the slides, um, uh, there was a lot of message in what he presented. Um, and as I said, I took notes and uh, learned quite a lot from him. I hope the rest that, that applies to us as well. And um, Professor uh, Hofstacken told us how the point of care uh, testing is happening in, uh, in this country. And we hope that um, Africa as a whole will be able to pick up these advances in uh, better ways of um, serving our patients across the continent. Thank you very much everyone for coming and um, please join us again the next time we invite you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Erasmus, and thank you, Professor uh, Hofstacken. Thank you, everyone who has attended, and thank you particularly for those who have stayed till the end. Um, thank you. To a close now. Thank you very much. Right. Have a good day. What is the rest of it? Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. God bless. All right. Bye. Bye bye.